Hello everybody, it's my pleasure to be with you today. I would like to thank the Egyptian Society of Cardiology for this kind invitation to participate in this review course. I am Walid Ammar, Associate Professor of Cardiology at Qasr Laini Faculty of Medicine, Cairo University. I would like to have this participation with you today. Uh, actually, my topic today is a very important topic and I'm pleased to uh, speak about this topic. It is related to the leading cause of death worldwide, which is chemical heart disease, namely complications of acute myocardial infarction. Uh, complications of acute myocardial infarction are many. Uh, they are either life-threatening like cardiogenic shock or very benign like pericarditis. Uh, and these complications, for example, include cardiogenic shock, acute heart failure, right ventricular infarction, mechanical complications like left ventricular septal rupture, left ventricular free rupture, mitral regurgitation, LV aneurysm. We may have electrical complications like ventricular arrhythmias, atrial fibrillation, or AV block. We have, may have ischemic complications like reinfarction or infarct extension or post-infarction angina. Other complications include embolic thrombotic and bleeding complications such as LV thrombi, venous thromboembolism, or vascular access bleeding complications related to PCI procedures. Finally, we have a pericardial complication, complications like pericarditis or pericardial effusion. LV dysfunction is the most frequent consequence of STEMI and is a powerful independent predictor of mortality. It's caused by myocardial loss or ischemic dysfunction, what's called stunning in some cases, and this may be worsened by arrhythmias, valvular dysfunction, or mechanical complications. Improvement in ventricular function usually occurs following early successful myocardial reperfusion, but this may take weeks to occur, and diagnosis is made mainly by clinical and imaging modalities, most frequently echocardiography. LV aneurysms may be either a true aneurysm or a false or pseudo aneurysm. LV true aneurysm, this occurs in less than 5% of patients with large transmural myocardial infarction undergo adverse neuromodeling with subsequent development of LV aneurysm. Patients frequently develop heart failure, which should be treated according to the specific guidelines for heart failure. Surgical aneurysmectomy seems of doubtful benefit. However, surgery may be considered in patients with large aneurysms and uncontrolled refractory heart failure or recurrent ventricular arrhythmias not amenable to ablation. On the other hand, LV pseudoaneurysm occurs when we have an incomplete rupture of LV free wall, and this rupture is sealed by pericardium and hematoma. It lacks the elements of myocardial wall. On the other hand, it is a pericardial wall and thrombi. We have by echo and echo leucine space external to the LV, and this space has a narrow neck with a ratio of the neck to the maximal diameter of less than 50%. It may contain thrombus with, with a very characteristic Doppler profile with a bi-directional to and fro flow pattern by echo. And this figure shows the difference between a true aneurysm on the right and left and the pseudoaneurysm. As you can see in this figure, the pseudoaneurysm has a narrow pace with the walls composed mainly of pericardium and lining thrombi, and this condition carries a high risk for pericard for rupture. So an urgent surgery is needed for pseudoaneurysm for fear of rupture. On the other hand, the true aneurysm have white base and the walls is composed of necrotic myocardium and the risk of rupture is low with true aneurysms. This echocardiographic uh, uh, imaging showing both of them on the left side we have evidence of a pseudoaneurysm with a narrow neck and the wall is composed of pericardium with lining thrombi. On the other hand we have evidence of apical scarring with apical true aneurysms. Next complication of myocardial infarction which you may encounter during hospitalization is LV thrombus. And LV thrombus formation is a frequent complication in patients with anterior myocardial infarction even in absence of apical aneurysm. And for mural thrombi, once diagnosed, oral anticoagulation should be considered for up to six months. And the duration is guided by repeated echocardiography with consideration of bleeding risk and the need for concomitant antiplatelet therapy to 
decide the risk and benefit ratio of bleeding versus prevention of thromboembolism. The clinical experience with direct oral anticoagulation compared to vitamin K antagonist is limited, but we have some evidence of superiority of vitamin K antagonist warfarin compared to new direct oral anticoagulants. This echo finding of LV thrombus, as you can see at the apex, and be careful that these patients have a high risk of systemic embolization, and the most common form is stroke, and this usually occurs within the first 10 days after myocardial infarction. Transthoracic echo is the modality of choice for diagnosis with a 92% sensitivity and 88% specificity. Another complication which you may encounter during management of uh, acute myocardial infarction is secondary mitral valve regurgitation. And this occurs as a result of LV remodeling. LV remodeling is a common cause of secondary or functional mitral regurgitation. Why this occurs? It occurs due to three factors. Lateral and apical displacement of the papillary muscles, leaflet tethering, and finally annular dilatation. This is more often a late complication, but may also occur in subacute setting in patients with extensive infarctions, especially in the posterior, in the posterior and lateral region of the LV, causing significant dysfunction of the posteromedial papillary muscle and mitral regurgitation. We know that transthoracic echo is a fundamental for initial diagnosis of secondary mitral regurgitation. However, transesophageal echo may be needed for better definition of the mechanism and the severity of mitral regurgitation. How to manage mitral regurgitation, functional or secondary mitral regurgitation as a complication of myocardial infarction? The severity of mitral regurgitation may improve with reperfusion and aggressive medical therapy, including diuretics and arterial vasodilators. And in non-responders with severe mitral regurgitation, refractory heart failure, or hemodynamic instability, urgent emergent sur valve surgery is indicated. In these patients, mitral valve replacement is associated with improved survival and LV function compared to medical therapy alone. Another common complication of myocardial infarction is right ventricular myocardial infarction, or RV involvement. RV involvement is most frequently occurred in the setting of inferior or infraposterior myocardial infarction, where the culprit artery is the right coronary artery. Diagnosis can be made in the, by the presence of elevation of the ST segment by one millimeter or more in leads AVR, V1, and in the right pericordial leads, namely V3R, V4R, which should be routinely performed in patients with inferior myocardial infarction. As you can see in this electrocardiogram, we have evidence of inferior ST segment elevation in least 2, 3, and AVF, together with ST segment elevation in right pericordial leads V3R up to V6R, in addition to atrial fibrillation as a complication also in this case. Patients with RV infarction may have an uncomplicated course or develop the typical triad of hypotension, clear lung fields, and increased jugular venous pressure. They also present more frequently with ventricular arrhythmias, AV plug, mechanical complications, low cardiac output, and shock. RV infarction is not a benign complication of myocardial infarction. ECHO is commonly used to confirm diagnosis of RV, of RV infarction, but RV infarction may also be assessed with CMR, cardiac magnetic resonance. What are the echocardiographic features of RV infarction? We have many, as you can see in this slide. We may have a focal RV wall motion abnormalities, what's called McConnell sign, sparing the apex. Paradoxical septal motion due to acute volume overload of the right ventricle. Dilatation of the right side, RV and RA. Small left ventricle. Pooing of the interatrial septum from right to left because of volume overload over the right side. RV thrombus, tricuspid regurgitation, impaired RV systolic function as evidenced by reduction of TAPC. We may have IVC plethora because of systemic congestion. We may have right to left shunt across patent foramen oval also. How to manage RV infarction? The management of RV ischemia or infarction includes early reperfusion with particular care in opening the RV branches as you can see in this angiography. On the left side, we can see a totally occluded right coronary, and during PCI, we pass the wire and pallone to open the right coronary artery, and finally, we have a beautifully patent right coronary artery and patent RV branches.
It's important to remember that avoidance of therapies that reduce preload like nitrates, diuretics, and the correction of AV dyssynchrony and the correction of atrial fibrillation and or AV block with sequential basing is indicated. It's important to regain and maintain AV dyssynchrony to improve RV function in setting of RV myocardial infarction. Now we come to the most malignant complication of acute myocardial infarction, namely cardiogenic shock. Cardiogenic shock is defined as persistent hypotension. Systolic blood pressure less than 90 mm mercury, despite adequate filling status with signs of hypoperfusion. It complicates 6 to 10 percent of all cause, of all cases of STEMI and remains a leading cause of death, with an in-hospital mortality of up to 50 percent of or more. Cardiogenic shock does not often present before admission to the hospital. In half of the cases, 50 percent of patients develop cardiogenic shock in the first six hours, and 75 percent develop cardiogenic shock within the first 24 hours. Patients typically present with hypotension, evidence of low cardiac output, like resting tachycardia, altered mental status, oliguria, cold periphery, and pulmonary congestion also. From hemodynamic point of view, patients with cardiogenic shock are characterized by having a cardiac index less than 2.2 liter per minute per meter square, with a wedge pressure more than 18 millimeter mercury, and urine output less than 20 milli per 20 milliliter per hour. Shock is also considered to be present if intravenous inotropic agents or mechanical support are needed to maintain a systolic blood pressure of more than 90 millimeter mercury. This table shows the most common etiologies of cardiogenic shock in the setting of acute myocardial infarction. The most common is a predominant left ventricular failure. The second is mechanical complications, namely severe mitral regurgitation, ventricular septal rupture, isolated RV infarction, or free rupture with tamponade. The average mortality is about 60% for cardiogenic shock in these conditions. In STEMI patients presenting with cardiogenic shock in which PCI-mediated reperfusion is estimated to occur after more than 120 minutes, immediate fibrinolysis and the transfer to a PCI-capable hospital is preferred and should be considered. Don't wait. Give fibrinolytic therapy and then immediately transfer the patient. And when the patient arrived to a PCI-capable center, emergent angiography is indicated, importantly, regardless of the ST segment resolution and the time for room for prenolysis. This patient with cardiogenic shock should routinely enter to the CAST lab regardless of the result of a prenolytic therapy. It's usually associated with extensive LV damage, but all keep in mind it may occur due to RV infarction. Mortality appears to be associated with initial LV systolic function, initial RV systolic function, and severity of mitral regurgitation. Other parameters that may contribute to mortality includes serum lactate, creat level, the agents may predict mortality. Come to mechanical complications of acute myocardial infarction. These mechanical complications may occur in the first days following STEMI, although the incidence has fallen significantly in the era of primary BCI. Mechanical complications are usually life-threatening and they need prompt detection and management. How to expect if this patient develop mechanical complication. Sudden hypotension, recurrence of chest pain, new cardiac murmurs suggestive of mitral regurgitation or VSD, pulmonary congestion, jugular venous distension. All these manifestations and the clinical presentations should raise a suspicion of mechanical complications. What to do? Immediate echocardiographic assessment is needed when mechanical complication is suspected. Come to one of the most fatal complications of the, of the mechanical complications, which is a free wall rupture. Rupture of LV free wall may occur in less than 1% of patients during the first week following a transmural infarction and may present with sudden cardiac death and cardiovascular collapse with without electromechanical dissociation. What are the risk factors for free wall rupture? We have old age, lack of reperfusion, or late fibrinolysis. These appear to be associated with increased incidence of free war rupture. The development of hemopericardium and tamponade leading to sudden profound shock is usually a fatal condition. The diagnosis is confirmed as expected by echocardiography.
This echo picture showing evidence of free wall rupture with pericardial effusion and on the right side you can see with contrast the echo evidence of passing its contrast through the rupture to the pericardium. How to manage free wall rupture? Ventricular repair with pericardial patch is recommended. Keep in mind it is a fatal condition. Mortality rates are in order of 20 and up to 75% operative mortality for a free wall rupture. But this is the only management strategy. Depending on what mortality, depending on the condition of the patient, the size and the morphology of the rupture. In suitable patients, CMR can complement the diagnosis by identifying the contained cardiac rupture and its anatomical features to guide surgical intervention. The second most important mechanical complication is ventricular septal rupture, and this occurs in less than 1% of patients with acute myocardial infarction. It has a bimodal distribution, either in the first 24 hour or later, or later within three to five days. Any portion of the septum may be involved at the margin between a necrotic and a viable non-necrotic myocardium. These are the sites of ventricular septal rupture. Anterior ventricular septal rupture tends to be located distally with defects that perforate the septum at the same level, what's called a simple ventricular septal defect. On the other hand, inferior ventricular septal rupture or defects are located more basal and follows a serpiginous course, what's called complex. Basal VSDs are difficult to manage than simple, apically located VSDs. Ventricular septal rupture usually presents as rapid onset of, and of clinical deterioration with acute heart failure or cardiogenic shock with loud systolic murmur occurring during the subacute phase of STEMI. As the diagnosis is confirmed by echocardiography and Doppler, which will differentiate VSD from acute mitral regurgitation. It will define the rupture, its size, its site. It will quantify the left to right chunk, which can be more precisely confirmed by swan gans caster. swan gans caster, one of the main indications for using it is left to right chunk due to VSD. As you can see in this echocardiographic pictures, we have evidence of apically located VSD with color passing from left to right, and using a Doppler waveform, we have characteristic Doppler profile of VSD. How to manage VSD? The chant may result in signs and symptoms of acute neo-onset right-side heart failure. Intraortic balloon pump may stabilize the patient in preparation for angiography and surgery. Keep in mind that be cautious with using IV diuretics and device dilators because these patients are most, most of the time hypotensive. Surgical repair may be required urgently, but there is no consensus on the optimal timing of surgery. Why we don't have consensus? Because the operative mortality is high. Early surgery is associated with a high mortality up to 40% and a high, also high risk of recurrent ventricular rupture, while delayed surgery allows easier septal repair in scarred tissue but carries the risk of rupture extension and this while we are waiting for surgery. Therefore, what to do? Immediate surgery or postpone surgery? This depends on the clinical condition and the response of the patients to treatment. For this reason, early surgery should be performed in all patients with severe heart failure that does not respond rapidly to aggressive therapy, but delayed elective surgery Repair may be considered in patients who respond well to aggressive heart failure therapy. Now we have other modality of treatment for VSD complicating acute myocardial infarction, which is a percutaneous repair. Percutaneous closure of the defect with appropriately designed devices become an alternative to surgery. As you can see in this echo at the arrow, we have site, we have an epically located VSD, and on the right side, we have a VSD closure device that successfully closed the defect. The third mechanical complication of acute myocardial infarction is a papillary muscle rupture causing acute severe mitral regurgitation. Acute mitral regurgitation may occur two to seven days after acute myocardial infarction due to rupture of the papillary muscle or the corda tendine. The rupture may be complete, which causes acute pulmonary edema, most of the time incompatible with life, or involve one or more of the heads, 
and is more frequently in the posteromedial papillary muscle. We know that we have the anterolateral and posteromedial papillary muscle. Why the posteromedial papillary muscle is commonly affected? Because it has a single blood supply compared to the anterolateral, which receives dual blood supply. Papillary muscle rupture usually presents as sudden hemodynamic deterioration with acute dyspnea, pulmonary edema, with or without cardiac shock. Systolic murmur is, frequent, is frequently underappreciated. Don't depend on auscultation to diagnose acute mitral regurgitation. It may be silent. Emergency echo is diagnostic. How to manage acute mitral regurgitation due to papillary muscle rupture? Immediate treatment is based on afterload reduction to reduce the regurgitant volume and pulmonary congestion. How to do that? Using intravenous diuretics, vasodilators, intravenous support, or a mechanical support with intraortic balloon pump. This may contribute to patient stabilization in preparation for angio and surgery. The final destination is surgical intervention. Emergency surgery is a treatment of a choice, although it carries a high operative mortality, reaching up to 25%. Valve replacement is often required, but some cases of repair have been reported. Come to another complication of acute myocardial infarction, which is a pericarditis. And we have three major pericardial complications. We have early infarct-associated pericarditis. We have a late pericarditis, what's called postcardic injury or the Ressler syndrome, and finally pericardial effusion. What about pericarditis? Early post-MI pericarditis usually occurs soon after a STEMI and is a transient benign finding. Whereas late infarct associated pericarditis, the Ressler syndrome, typically occurs after one to two weeks after a STEMI and is of a presumed immune mediated pathogenesis. We all know this. How to initiate this immune Pathogenesis through triggering by initial damage to the pericardial tissue caused by myocardial necrosis. Post early and late pericarditis are rare in primary PCI era. We have decreased incidence of pericardial complications after the widespread application of primary PCI. And they are often related to reper delayed reperfusion or failed reperfusion as well as large infarct size. These are the risk factors for pericarditis. How to diagnose pericarditis? The diagnostic criteria for acute pericarditis are as usual, two or more of these findings. Pyloretic chest pain, pericardial friction drop, ECG changes, which may occur in less than 60% of cases, with a widespread ST segment elevation, which is usually mild and progressive, or PR depression in the acute phase. Finally, pericardial effusion in less than 60% of cases also, but generally it's mild effusion. How to manage pericarditis? Anti-inflammatory therapy is indicated post MI pericarditis for symptom relief and the reduction of recurrence of pericarditis. Aspirin is a treatment of a choice. It's, a tr it's the anti-inflammatory therapy of a choice in post MI pericarditis. However, the used dose is a little bit large dose. We prescribe aspirin as 500 up to 1000 milligram every six to eight hours for one to two weeks and to decrease the total daily dose by 500 milligrams every one to two weeks. What to add on aspirin? Colchicine is recommended first line therapy adjunct to aspirin for three to six months in the presence of recurrence of pericarditis. What about using corticosteroids to treat pericarditis and to prevent recurrence? Do not use corticosteroids. It's class 3. It's contraindicated due to the risk of a scar thinning with aneurysm formation and rupture. Pericardiosynthesis is rarely required, except for cases of hemodynamic compromise with signs of tamponade. Now, pericardial effusion. How to diagnose and manage? post stemi patients with pericardial effusion who fulfill pericarditis criteria should be managed as pericarditis with aspirin colchicine. Patients without inflammatory signs of pericarditis but have circumferential pericardial effusion more than 10 mm or have evidence of tamponade should be investigated for possible subacute rupture. Pericardial effusion may be the only clue for a life-threatening complication with subacute rupture of the free left ventricular wall. You look by echo or by CMR to detect the subacute rupture.
Pericardiosynthesis is rarely required. Echo will detect and quantify the size of the effusion, it is blood or not, and what about reaccumulation, and by which we may decide to have exploratory surgery or not. The final mechanical complication which is rarely encountered is dynamic LV outflow tract obstruction. The patient before infarction does not have LV outflow tract obstruction, but because this patient sustained an apical infarction, but the pace was spared, now we have hyperkinesis at the pace, and this commonly encountered in patients with Takotsubo cardiomyopathy, for example. This basal hyperkinesis will result in systolic anterior motion of the mitral leaflet, dynamic left ventricular outflow tract obstruction, hypotension, systolic murmur. Keep in mind that this outflow obstruction is exacerbated by inotropic agents and the intraortic balloon pump. Do not use them in this setting. Then echo finding showing this dynamic outflow through tract obstruction as a result of apical infarction is pairing the base with hyperkinesis at the base. Come to the final part of the presentation, which is arrhythmic complications related to acute or electrical complications related to acute myocardial infarction. We'll speak in briefly on atrial fibrillation, ventricular arrhythmias, and AV block. Let's start with atrial fibrillation. In think of atrial fibrillation, you decide either rate control or rhythm control. Who want to go for rhythm control? Immediate electrical cardioversion is indicated and the class 1 recommendation when rate control cannot be achieved properly with pharmacological agents. In patients with AF, with ongoing ischemia, hemodynamic compromise or heart failure, go for electrical cardioversion. What is the role of beta blockers and amiodarone? You may use intravenous beta blocker for rate control, but not in patients with heart failure or hypotension. You may use intravenous amiodarone again for rate control in patients with heart failure, but not in patients with hypotension. The only indication for digoxin in acute myocardial infarction is to achieve some rate control of AF in patients with heart failure and hypotension. Okay. Can you cardiovert patients with amiodarone? Yes, intravenous amiodarone is indicated for electrical cardioversion or to decrease the rate of recurrence of atrial fibrillation after electrical cardioversion in unstable patients with recent onset AF. In patients with documented AF, it's important to prescribe him after that oral anticoagulation, class 2A recommendation. But keep in mind the risk of bleeding because these patients are on dual antiplatelets. For how long you have to decide. Importantly, it's class 3, it's contraindicated to use digoxin for converting patients with AF to normal sinus rhythm. It's not effective and harmful. Calcium channel blocker and beta blockers, including sotalol, are ineffective as pharmacological agents for cardioversion. Prophylactic treatment with antiarrhythmic drugs to prevent AF is not indicated again. You don't give medications as prophylaxis like amiodarone or sotalol. Now come to management of ventricular arrhythmias and the conduction disturbance in the acute phase. It's class 1 recommendation to use intravenous beta blockers in patients with polymorphic VTAC or VF unless contraindicated. Prompt it's the most important that prompt and complete revascularization is recommended to treat myocardial ischemia that may present in patients with recurrent ventricular tachycardia or ventricular fibrillation. Intravenous amiodarone is recommended for treatment of recurrent polymorphic ventricular tachycardia. Correlation of electrolyte imbalance, especially potassium and magnesium, is recommended. The conclusion of this slide is that immediate complete reperfusion and revascularization is the first line of therapy. If you need intravenous beta blocker, intravenous amiodarone plus correction of electrolytes. In case of sinus bradycardia with hemodynamic intolerance or high degree AV block with, without a stable escape rhythm, what to do? Positive chronotropic agents like epinephrine, vasopressin, and or atropine are indicated as class 1 recommendation to increase the sinus rhythm and improve AV conduction. Temporary pacemaker may be indicated in case of failure to respond to positive chronotropic agents. Finally, urgent angiography with intention to revascularize is indicated if the patient does not receive previous reperfusion strategy. Keep in mind that amiodarone is class 2A recommendation if the patient developed the recurrent ventricular tachycardias and despite repetitive electrical cardioversion. 
you can add amiodarone to decrease the need for electrical cardioversions. The other way is to insert a transvenous caster for termination through overdrive pacing if the patient developed VTAC despite repetitive electrical cardioversion. Finally, radiofrequency caster ablation in a specialist, uh, specialized ablation center followed by ICD implantation should be considered in patients with recurrent VTAC, VF, or electrical storm despite complete revascularization and optimal medical therapy. Recurrent ventricular tachycardia with hemodynamic repercussion despite repetitive electrical cardioversion may be treated with lidocaine if beta blocker amiodarone and overdrive stimulation are not effective. This is the last medication to be used to treat ventricular arrhythmias. So we start with revascularization, then beta blockers, amiodarone, correction of electrolytes, and if despite all of these, you'd insert a caster for overdrive pacing termination, and all of these failed, you can use lidocaine and its class 2P recommendation. Keep in mind that it is not indicated to prescribe medications for prophylaxis against ventricular arrhythmias, its class 3 recommendation. Also, asymptomatic and hemodynamically stable patients with BVCs are not receiving, you do not prescribe antiarrhythmic medications for these patients. This is my last slide in this presentation. What about long-term management of ventricular arrhythmias and risk of sudden cardiac death? Escalus, one recommendation to advise patients for ICD therapy to reduce sudden cardiac death in patients with symptomatic heart failure, NEHA class 2 or 3, with ejection fraction less than 35%, despite optimal medical therapy for three months and at least six weeks after acute myocardial infarction who expected or survive for for patients who expect to survive for more than one years. In these patients, you advise for ICD as a prophylactic treatment or primary prevention against sudden cardiac death. Finally, ICD implantation or temporary use of wearable cardioverter defibrillator may be considered if the patient developed arrhythmias in less than six weeks or less than 40 days after acute myocardial infarction in selected patients patients with incomplete revascularization, pre-existing LV dysfunction, occurrence of arrhythmias more than 48 hours after STEMI, or patients with polymorphic VTAC or VF despite revascularization. In these six weeks, you can prescribe the patient a wearable temporary defibrillator until you exceed the six weeks, after which you decide this patient needs permanent ICD or not. Thank you very much. At the end, I would like to thank you for kind attention. I hope this presentation was satisfactory to you. Thank you very much.